With the discussion on the Shambler completed, which if you haven't seen that, I will actually link it at the top, it would appear as though the infected within Seattle fall under very different categories. I postulated that there were several factors affecting the Shambler, which may be kind of why we didn't actually see these things running around the entire country. People in the comments started questioning, that, well, why do we see them in more arid regions of California? And that's why, like, I want to bring it up again. I don't really believe that water plays that much of a factor concerning its creation. With that said, one creature in particular appears complex, but is actually just a complete problem Product of its environment. During the initial outbreak 25 years previous, there was a very poor understanding of how the cordyceps worked its way through the body, entered the cerebral spinal fluid, and then worked its way up to the brain, ultimately taking over a person and changing them into a hungry, cannibalistic animal overriding the cerebrum and likely the limbic system. In an effort to help people, Fedra would quarantine them in the basement of the hospital and attempt to figure out a way to secure them away from others, as well as increase their understanding of how this disease was affecting people. However, during the middle of this, it became clear that this wasn't just an ordinary infection, but was likely a species-ending event if not carefully monitored. Despite their best efforts, eventually everything would fall apart as Fedra was forced not to only deal with the infected, but also deal with the WLFs and Seraphites within the same area. It became too overwhelming and harsher methods were needed until eventually full-scale rebellion broke out, pushing the federal government out of the area, which left Seattle to the two warring factions of the Wolves and Seraphites, and I guess a third faction, which is the infected, but those who were contained within the hospital were left alone alone in the dark after the generators went out. Here, much like the Shamblers, a different creature would be born out of the fungal growths due to necessity and survival. This creature would appear to be a bloater mixed with a few stalkers and potentially clickers. This conglomeration of bodies stuck together appears much more likely to have been due to proximity to one another and only through the binding and bonding of their forms were they actually able to stay alive. This would have far-reaching effects on the area and for each individual creature as we will see during the skirmish with Abby. So the first question we have to ask ask is why does this thing exist? Again, going back to the Shambler video, which is not necessarily gospel at this point, but if you saw my Master Chief versus Doom Slayer video, you will actually know that I kind of get things right some of the times, but I would have to say that this creature exists because of its environment and because of its age. It exists because if it didn't, then all we would see within the basement of this place would be a sprawling fungus that we see in all the other environments. Once an infected drops for good, the body is broken down into the same fungus for nutrition and food. It would appear as the stalkers, clickers, and singular bloater known as the Rat King are all alive and functional, likely due to their close proximity. But before getting to their combined, or likely why they are all together in one giant monster mash, we must first start with the morphology of this creature and see how many we are actually dealing with, and why when one stalker gets knocked off the body or really detaches itself, it is much more resilient than the rest. Starting with the feet, we can see it actually has three points of contact. Two main feet belong to the bloater, which is likely where most of the strength of the walk comes from, but there is a third point of contact, which is simply the hand and arm of the clicker on the left side of the body. On the bloater legs, much like what I talked about during my bloater episode, we see that this is a larger human with likely more body fat than normal. We see on the legs that this fat is still present. I'm beginning to think that I have mentioned this actually in quite a few episodes concerning the cordyceps, but body fat seems to play a role in the longevity of the body concerning the fungus. And specifically the shamblers and bloaters, they appear to take longer to form, years even. Clickers, stalkers, and runners are all more quickly formed, but you tend to find more average sized humans pinned to the wall in a fungal sprawl, suggesting that once the body runs out of resources entirely, they will drop. However, that said, the bloater has been underground for 25 years, so the amount of body fat on it would likely have dropped as well. This would indicate that a much more symbiotic relationship between the fungus and the host exists for larger people, as calories are used less than normal, or perhaps the fungus contributes caloric intake as well. Which is actually explained in the Shambler episode when I mentioned how the Shambler eats. So if you haven't seen that one, skip about 55 seconds into the video and you actually get to the Shambler. Moving up to the pelvis, we see that a mass of fungus has grown around the pelvic area and on the left leg specifically, we see the remnants of a clicker. This clicker is still very much alive, helping the Rat King remain upright and walking, but the person was further along, meaning that they were likely added later to the infection mass than when the stalkers were. Moving up to the sides, we can see that many fungal blooms have afflicted the left side and we can also see the outline of the clicker's body fully running up to the chest area. On the chest concerning the right pectoral, we see more fungal growths like on the pelvic area. The right arm seems to be barely afflicted with this infection, but it does appear a little inflamed. The left arm shows more of the armor plating that the bloater is known for. Moving up to the shoulders, we can see that the head has several stalkers that have become conjoined with the Rat King. Before getting there though, the head of the bloater has the brain almost completely gone at this point and has been replaced with long wispy fungal stalks which go off to the side. Likely this is due to the fact that directly above this head is a mouth 
mouth of another stalker, and the stalks wouldn't really grow all that well if they were bitten off. So off to the side of the bloater, we see that another stalker has conjoined over the shoulder of the bloater, almost like it was being carried. The long arms of the stalker are much more skinny, but are less affected with the fungal infection. Its head is shaped the same as the bloater, except, you know, completely mirroring it, with the stalks off to the opposite side. Draped over the top of the Rat King is another infected, having their chest facing upwards. Their spine would likely have been bent in an unnatural position, but it's not like it really matters because they're all fused. The arms are still functional, and much like the other two, the brain is almost completely gone, with stalks staying out of the way of the other infected heads. There does appear to be a third stalker bonded to the back from all the arms that we see. This one is almost combined to the uh, bloater back to back, seeing as the arms are just mirroring the front. So getting a look at this thing, we can kind of see it's just a sprawling mess of nasty visuals and raw power. If you didn't know, there is an old idea that if your muscles all pulled in one direction, we could actually lift around 25 tons just one time because then it would all just be burnt out. Well, with this creature, the additional bodies attached to the bloater's body has allowed it to be much stronger than any one individual infected. And considering the fungus overrides the human brain and allows muscles to be pulled much harder, this leads to some bad yet hilarious moments where Abby is being bodied because I'm sorry, I don't like Abby. I just don't like her. So I really don't feel bad when she literally gets torn a new one by this thing. I think it's basically canonical. So what we first need to establish is how cohesive is this thing? Well, looking at its body, it's pretty clear that there is really no defining lines apart from the heads and arms. The extra limbs and faces are clearly seen, but concerning the rest of the bodies, the skin has all fused together. This has another implication as well. Because the skin is fused due to the cordyceps working its way through, and the fact that the skin is still technically dividing via mitosis, this has caused a singular organism to form by the bridging effect of this fungus. This would also indicate that my thinking on the cordyceps subduing the immune system must also have some credence because there is no immune response that we can see, but I digress from that point. But if the skin is then fused, then the muscle underneath may have also fused to a degree, and even past that, perhaps new connections within the nervous tissue or the fungus itself playing some role as nervous tissue. Now, there's something to be said about being a part of a creature for a long time and learning movement. We do this with spouses, families, really anything, and I know you're not like literally a part of them, but you know how like subconsciously you begin to like learn people's patterns and then you adopt those patterns. But this thing, however, does not have the luxury of utilizing its big brainy brain to move together. Instead, it seems to be able to move much more as a unit due to connections. Something is piloting the bloater. Instinct, leftover cerebellum, brainstem. Fact is, is that it's still somewhat functional and making an electrical impulse. The others that have formed with it would have been moving in a much more kind of awkward way because it's not like they would understand they are a part of something that's moving independently and they needed to help. So again, this suggests while not complete, it seems as though maybe some electrical signals from the remnants of the brain of the bloater would influence those attached to it. And why do I imagine this to be the case? Because of what we see when the Rat King takes enough damage. Upon this creature being heavily damaged by Abby, one of the stalkers will completely break off of it. When it does this, it literally has to tear itself away with sinewy tissue, blood, and skin being left behind. The stalker will continue to, wait for it, stalk you the rest of the time until finally taking out the Rat King. While there is no way to bring the stalker down before the Rat King, which is just game mechanics, it does make sense as to why it is so tough by comparison to its standard stalker forms. When the bloater is left to grow and change on its own, the body will undergo many changes, but without literally rehashing my bloater video, one of the main things that happens to it is the addition of more hard fungal growths on the surface. The skin appears to be soft on the Rat King in most areas, but in some areas we can see discoloration, suggesting that these hard growths are there. When the stalker breaks off, we see that these hard growths have actually bridged from the bloater to the stalker, and by association, growth association, they protect the stalker with equal padding. Not to mention, the stalker can also throw the fungal pods that tend to burst and blind you for a second, just like the bloater can. But likely the bloater's mass was used to grow these fungal plates and pods rather than the stalker, and instead it just spread. So now we can start to really form an idea of why this thing actually exists, and possibly why we don't see it in other places. Moving underneath Seattle or through the buildings, we see in many areas the stalkers actually come out of the walls to attack. It's almost as if the stalker is about to be consumed by the fungal sprawl, but upon hearing non-infected, they begin their attack and lead that sprawl. We see that the effects, if no non-infected walks by, are that many skeletons can be seen and those are pretty much sucked dry. Moving in the hospital, we can see that in many areas where the stalker would likely exist, but have not come out yet or are already past the expiration date. We see moving through, we find kind of notes of people being contained there, as well as people left in their individual rooms. We also see kind of a cool thing where there's sort of like mental degradation of someone and how their mind kind of begins to go as they are taken 
over and then leave notes behind for their wife. But it appears as though those rooms were separated, so they continue to progress normally like the rest of the infected. Moving into the next area, we see that the amount of spores are incredibly thick, and this indicates that there were quite a few people in here. It also suggests there were quite a lot of people in here when they were somehow trapped. After being trapped, many would likely be infected and would continue wandering around for years until they ended up dropping. By chance, one person was larger than the rest, which in today's day is really not that small of a chance, but with everyone infected on the inside of the hospital, they would all be stuck there permanently until Abby happens by. Prior to this, roughly a decade later, the bloater would have reached its final form. Any remaining stalkers in the area would likely have moved into the walls, where a lot of them would probably just be spore creators. But some were still viable, but dwindling. A lone clicker would likely have been moving around, unlike the stalkers, seeing as clickers can last for years. So what I imagine happening was that the bloater eventually started standing still, and due to fungal infection in their bodies, a fungal sprawl likely began to form, and perhaps the bloater was also standing close to that wall. Eventually, the fungal sprawl connected a few stalkers to the bloater. At first, this really didn't do much, but the lines of nutrient sharing became stronger. As the roadways strengthened, they would more than likely continue to grow as more and more were connected. Those around them who were not connected would wither and become the sprawl. Those connected would likely begin to fuse by proximity. It may have also been possible that there were those connected to the bloater who were too far away, and when the movement happened, they were left behind. But those those that were almost pressed up against the bloater would have been fused. The clicker would have likely at some point happened upon the sprawl by chance, stopped moving, or fell. When it did this, there was really no further stimulation and there was no reason to stand back up or continue moving. And this means that where it fell next to the leg of the bloater, its own connection points form later on and it appears different from the rest. So then from here, another 15 years pass. Because they had a nutrient level of five bodies, this creature by chance was able to outlast the others and as a result would remain. Likely still stuck to the wall, this is why it doesn't outright attack Abby after she enters the area. Peeling itself off, it would take a moment to get a move on, and then once it did, it was able to engage Abby. However, this would ultimately spell its undoing, but what happens in the actual canonical ending where Abby is decimated by this creature? Well, let's discuss that. There are many ways for this thing to take you out. Considering it's just a mass of teeth and hunger likely stemming from it being sequestered underground for so long, if it grabs you, it has a tendency to go for the jugular. If you thought being bit by one was bad, imagine getting bit by like all four with the fifth one on the back not really doing anything except freaking out. But ultimately this will lead to a quick bleed out and an ending. Another way is it appears to be able to mass grab you. With so many arms and hands holding onto Abby, it's not too surprising that one gets under her chin and tries to pull her head back, which ultimately snaps her neck so badly that the vertebrae pierces the skin and leads to further bleeding. But it's not really that big of a deal because at that point uh, you wouldn't feel your body or you would likely just be in complete shock and unconscious. The last way is remember when I said that if every muscle in your body pulled in the same direction, we could lift 25 tons. Well, with all these bodies here, it's safe to say that it can at least pull with quite a few tons in one direction. Should you be running away from the Rat King and it grab you, it will lift you in the air where it will use the bloater arm, which is more powerful, and grab your leg. Just above the knee, it will tear away the quadricep muscles, tendons, and ligaments, which are necessary to hold your knee together and attach it to the femur, and it'll just completely sever that. Upon doing so, that would likely also sever the popliteal artery, Actually, it absolutely would sever the popliteal artery, which is located behind the knee, which ultimately would cause a bleed out in seconds. Not to mention, if the femur was damaged during this in the process, this could lead to unconsciousness. Because if you didn't know, the femur can hold half a liter to one and a half liters of blood, causing you to meet your end ridiculously fast. So remember, kids, don't fracture your femurs or your pelvis, because that's a massive chunk of blood gone in a very short amount of time. Much like the Shambler, the Rat King appears to be a perfect combination of the right place at the right time depending on your definition of that. Fusing with the stalkers in the wall due to its own fungal sprawl has caused many to become intertwined with it, and later a clicker was thrown into the mix, making a creature powerful enough to break through walls, pull off human legs, and really just be a complete bullet sponge. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, leaving a like would be great, and subbing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Twitch, and channel links in the description. And if you didn't know, I can't really quit YouTube, so I'm streaming on YouTube again, so feel free to drop by sometime. I'm currently obsessed with WoW Classic and attempting to build a guild, so if y'all want to jump on Scarum, which is on WoW Classic, on the Alliance side, I would appreciate it because uh, we definitely need to body some Horde. But I'm also playing Subnautica on stream, so if you just want to come chill out, I will be doing that. Anyhow, speaking of patrons, I would like to thank mine real quick. Huge shout out to our three astronauts, AVC, Trey Windenall, and It's Not a Spoon. Thank you guys for your tremendous support. I really appreciate it. Next, our scientists are Skilt, and our residents are JJ Frost, Sir Perry, Vincent Garcia, Nahili, Robert Platt,
Platner, James Wiley, and some Red Dude. Thank you guys as well. And to the rest of my patrons, I really do appreciate your support of the channel. All right, so that does it for me. I am done with The Last of Us 2 forever. Thank God. Thank you for watching, and I will see y'all in the next one.